Yeah, let's roll this right away. How you doing, my man? It's been forever, man. It feels like it's been 20 years. Yeah, man, it's been a long stretch, Dennis. You know, I don't think anyone could have thought this shit up, you know, that we've been through the last two years. I know. It's been insane, huh? It's been, uh, it been way worse for you guys over there, though. Yeah. I, I, I think it, that's what it looked like, though. Yeah, I think we, we had a massive uh, government overreaction to everything here. I mean, the sanctions that we got put into, particularly in, in Melbourne, in, in my state, your other hometown, you know, it was nuts. But the, the gyms were... We were shut down six times for a total of 367 days. 367 days. All of no them. Training. All of them. When you add it all up, yeah, it was, it was over a year that our doors were shut. I mean, when I say shut, we weren't allowed to have anyone in the building. You know, it was zero income. You have to turn off all your membership payments. Um, you know, people can't train. So I sort of became an advocate for the um, fitness industry and done a ton of media and tried to... Um, through the media, educate the government that, that going to the gym is so much more than flexing your muscles or taking selfies, but how uh, how powerful it is for people's mental health, particularly when you're going through this stuff, you've got to have some kind of outlet. So not only were the gym shut, I mean, the restaurants, bars, everything except for supermarkets and pharmacies uh, were closed. You know, the schools were shut. Kids couldn't go to school. We had, um, we had a five kilometre, which is three mile, uh, radius you weren't allowed to go outside of that or you'd be arrested we had a curfew at night right where you couldn't leave your, your own house from 9 p.m until 5 a.m the next day for months at a time it was fucking insane i heard about the the, the five kilometer radius which is about what about the, the, three miles three miles so that means if that if they would pull you over they would ask you where you live and they would literally punch in your address and find out if you yeah. are too far away from your house? Yeah, and then you get fined 5,000. Get out of here. Yeah, no shit, yeah. That's crazy, that's crazy. Did you get, yeah. did you, so, so did, did everybody follow the rules though? Or did you? Did... Um, look, they, they kind of got to the stage where you had to, you know, like, it was crazy. Like, uh, police patrols um, at night, you know, uh, in the city, you know, there was like, police on horseback and big groups of police marching everywhere, checking IDs and stuff. And mm. it got to the point where, where people were compliant because, yeah, they basically said that's the only way we're going to get back. And then, um, yeah, then there was forced vaccination on top of that, that in the end we weren't allowed to open any businesses until 80% of the population was, was double vaccinated. Wow. So, so, so that happened, you know, 80% of people were double vaccinated. Mm. And then the people that weren't, we're not allowed to go back to work. I'm not allowed to go to the gym or anything. I, I remember following you on your Instagram. I see sometimes, they, a couple of times, they reopened and then they yeah. shut them down again. That got to be frustrating. Yeah. yeah, bad. Because, you know, it, it, a couple of times it was like only three or four weeks. You know, so there's never going to be any more lockdowns. We're good. We're back. And then you get, shit, one time we got six hours notice. Yeah, it was crazy, then I said, it, it's, um, I mean, then on top of that, for me, you know, we we when we cancelled the Arnold or postponed the Arnold in 2020, you know, I went over to Columbus, hung out with you guys. I um, emceed the show over there. You know, it was looking good. I come back here to do our event, and five days before our event, the whole thing got shut down. I remember that because I think um, um, Sergio was over there, and yeah. he, he got stuck in Australia because you know you couldn't yeah. hold you couldn't hold the event. You somehow yeah. managed to do the amateur show somehow, right? Yeah, what I did, I, I got like an underground warehouse because I'd promised the pro qualifier and we'd had all the, the, the five events around the states leading up to the pro qualifier, so everyone was ready to go. So at that stage, the government said we could have up to 100 people in, indoors, you know, with, with all the distancing and stuff. So I literally hired a warehouse and turned it into a theatre and um, you know, I'd lost that much money Mm. What's another What's another twenty grand going to matter? You know, it's like we're so far gone. I mean, I lost um, seven hundred thousand on the Arnold, um, shutting it down with five days' notice because I'd had eight staff on for a year. I'd paid all the advertising, you know, I'd do all the billboards all over the streets and all the street posters, all the Facebook ads. You don't get none of that back, right? So we we paid all of that. Then we postponed it. We said we'll do it in a year's time. Surely in one year everything's going to be cool. So I kept the staff on. And I kept the office open and we hung out for another year and uh, it got cancelled again. 
I'm like, shit. So then we realized we couldn't bring um, all the pros and all the international guys in. So I said, we'll do an Australian version. We'll call it FitFest. And we'll do that, which would have been last November 6th and 7th. And in July, I think it was, we went into a three-month lockdown. I'm like, what? Shit. What, what are we going to do now? And I, I, I kept the staff on all that time, kept the office open all that time. So each time this happens, you know, I lose another three or 400,000. So then we transferred it to April this year from November last year. And then, uh, like, well, I guess four or five weeks ago, the Australian Open tennis was on and it's an outdoor event and they cut the crowds to 50% capacity. Then they started cancelling like these ocean swim races and this country music festival and all this outdoor stuff. I'm like, shit, we've got no hope of 100% capacity in, inside a shed. You know, it's just not going to happen. So I called the convention centre um, and said, can you guys guarantee me, you know, 100% capacity? They're like, nope. It'll be 25 or 50 at best, but it might it might change in March. I'm like, we've got to sell an expo for April. How can we, how so can we you, do that? So you still don't even know? No, well, I, I postponed it now indefinitely, Dennis. I, I just oh. had to make a call and just cut it, man. It's that shit's fortnight. frustrating as fuck, man. I, and I know, and I mean, this is on a totally different level, the way you're doing shows over there. You know, compared to me, my show in Germany, it's also two years I had to cancel it because I couldn't have the crowd, so I know. But... I thought now everything's back to normal in Australia. Well, everything's getting back to normal now, but um, with indoor events, they're still not, like if, if you're in a theater style and you're all facing the same way, cool. But to have people packed into a, into a room like, like an expo is, they're not gonna allow that. They've still got a one person per two square meter rule. Oh. <laughs> right, so, so our, our exhibitors and sponsors and, and, and the athletes and the influencers, everyone would bring in, they want to fuck a pact. You know, they want people just jammed in and just screaming, yelling, and getting free stuff and taking selfies with people like you and all the other stars of the sport. So to have like, say 50% capacity inside an expo, is, it's, it's just not real. You know, if you had like a expo for, you know, mining or farm equipment or something, it wouldn't matter. Right. But with a fitness, fitness expo with, you know, 20 different sports, going there, powerlifting, strongman, bodybuilding, those areas got to be jammed for the for the thing to work. So I've just made a hard call and said, listen, the bodybuilding shows are going to go ahead, but the expo, I'm just going to take a breather for maybe a year, maybe two, until, until we've got real fresh air, blue skies. You know, I can't keep taking hits like that. You know, I nearly lost everything. Right. Uh, financially, you know, with the gym shut for so long and then cancelling the expo four times. And on top of that, we've... We've had to cancel now about 40 bodybuilding shows since the whole thing started. You know, we managed one little season here, one little season there, but for the most part, we've just had to cancel, cancel. And that, that's heartbreaking for the guys and girls getting ready for the right, shows. You know, right, right. Six weeks or 10 weeks in, into a prep, and then the government's like, nope, you ain't doing that. And then when we postpone, we have to say, well, it should be right for October, or it should be right for March or April, and then it happens again and again. So it's, it's been... It's been tough, man. Um, you know, and on top of that, for me, like I had this incredible life, Dennis. You know, traveling with with our crew. You know, with, with all the Arnold team. You know, Arnold and all of his team. You know, with Jim and you and Mal and all of our team. The Olympia you know, doing all the interviews all over the world, emceeing shows all over the world, doing Arnold's press conferences everywhere, living in hotels. You know, life was. I guess you start to take it for granted. Mm. You know, because for seven years that's all I did, and then it, it just got cut off in, in one day. It's just like I haven't left Australia since, you know, I went to the Arnold in um, March 2020. So it's two years next week um, since since I left the country. And then we, we weren't allowed to leave the country. And if we did, we weren't allowed back. And then if you could get out and back, there was two weeks quarantine in a hotel. And then if it just went on and on and on and on. And then the flights, you know, because there was only, I think, like a couple of hundred people a week coming into Australia. So the, the cost on a flight was like, 16 grand each way. It was wow. <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. Right? Wow. Yeah. So yeah. What, how is it now, though? Can you leave now if you want to leave? Yeah. Technically, you can, but getting flights back is still very difficult. Um, in fact, just yesterday, um, they allowed the first international tourist flights in in two years. Just yesterday. Oh, so now to, foreigners, uh, uh, travelers can now go to Australia yeah. officially? As of, as of yesterday, yeah, with, without doing the hotel quarantine or anything else. 
They've just got to be, I think, double or triple vaccinated or something. So that's Obviously, mandatory. Uh, so be vaccinated yeah. is mandatory. Oh yeah, yeah. To come into Australia, you've got to be got to be um, vaccinated. Uh, and most people here have. You know, most people here went, "Oh fuck it, we can't live like this. Just give me a shot." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, it got it got crazy, Dennis. You know, and then it brought out all these people saying, "Oh, I'm not putting that in my body." Man, fuckers have been vaccinated their whole life. Seriously, yeah, yeah, Some yeah. of the people, some of the people that said to me that I'm going to put that poison in their body, shit, man. Some of the things those people put in their body. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> That's what I said, you know. I mean, you know, I mean, I can understand when, when somebody says, you know, I'm not going to get it, you know, which I probably wouldn't get it either if I wouldn't have to travel. Right. Because, you know, I had it. I had COVID, you know, it didn't really affect me too much, you know. I, I wasn't sick. But still, I, I literally only got it because I needed to travel, you know. And if I want to see my parents who are in Germany who have the same rule as, as Australia, you got to be double vaccinated, triple, not double. Now you got to have the booster shot. And, uh, you know, that's why I said I got to get it because I can't not see my parents when something happens just because I didn't get the vaccine. You know, and at that point, I, I, w I wasn't connected enough to have, some, you know, to know someone who could get you a digital vaccine pass without even getting the vaccine, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah. so but uh, let me talk about Tony Doherty, the godfather of Australian bodybuilding. You know, Tony, we go back. I know you since. Oh, shit. Was it 2000? 1990 or 1999 what was it well the first pro show we did here that you came to was 2001 that was the first one okay yeah. so then then yeah. i then i was there in 2001 where does the love for bodybuilding come from because you know i, I remember you being the promoter of the uh what was the show called back then the australian australian pro, australian pro you yeah. know but you i know you've been involved in bodybuilding before that where did it really come from when did it all started for you well <clears throat> I started out, you know, competing when I was a kid. I just fell in love with bodybuilding. I saw, I actually saw Arnold on TV when I was a kid, and I just said, "Shit, that I'm, I'm, I'm good. I know what I want to do. I want to be a gym owner, a promoter, and a bodybuilder." From that day, hmm. and I knew. So you know, I competed a, a, a bit. I guess till I was like 25 or something, from 18 to 25, and started getting pretty good at it. But you know, not not. You know, back then there was no coaches or travel or like a way to turn pro or anything like that. But yeah, so it was just a real love of the sport. I love the gym. I still do. I never, never struggle to come into work. You know, particularly now that we've been locked up for so long, it made me even more grateful for it. But people always ask how I got here. I was willing to work just a little harder than everyone else every damn day. If I can have hundreds of hours back, you know I'm gonna grab them. Spending hours prepping chicken, rice, and vegetables, F that. I rely on perfect nutrition. I rely on trifecta. Um, I remember I went to this show and the, the IFBB promoters at the time had had enough and they're like, shit, if anyone here wants to be a promoter, put your hand up because we're done. So I contacted, you know, the people that are running bodybuilding here and and said, hey, give me a shot. And they're like, oh, you're a bit young. And I said, come on, just, just let me do one show. If I fuck it up, then we're done. So they let me do one show that was back in like 1988, I think. And, um, you know, so I became the Victorian promoter for, for IFBB at the time and um, just started emceeing shows everywhere. You know, I got to, uh, well, the first thing I did, Dennis, when I became the promoter is I, I went around and knocked on the door of a guy called Sonny Schmidt. Yes, because, I was I was about to ask you that too because I know yeah, you were close so, with Sonny. Yeah, well, Sonny had been competing with this federation that didn't lead anywhere. It was just kind of like a, a homegrown one. And so I went and knocked on his door. I go, dude, if you come, I, I need a superstar to make this work, and you need a promoter to get you overseas. So what about we work together? And a little to and fro, and then we had an Australian pro. There was one Australian pro in like nineteen, let's say eighty nine, and I said, I'll get you in it. And I got him in it. And, um, you know, he was like sixth or seventh or something like that. It was uh, Robbie Robinson and Gary Stridham were, were the winners. We had two shows in two states and they were the winners. Anyway, um, you know, I met the right people there and said, hey, you're, you're quite a good MC. Do you want to come to the States and MC? So when I took um, Sonny overseas, I, I got to MC a show in um, Buffalo, New York. And then I got to MC the Night of Champions in, I guess, United Champions or the New York United Champions back in New York back in the uh, yeah 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 the Be the one Be Beacon Theater 
the Beacon Theatre. So yeah, I was just yeah. a kid, kid from the country. You know, here I am. Hey, welcome to New York City. <laughs> and uh, that was that was a show that the only show that Dorian lost on US soil. There was that one and the Olympia that year. And that uh, was Benazizio that won. was the Benazizio one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He won it. And and Sonny finished like sixth, and then next year he got second, and he qualified for the Olympia. So then I started traveling with the circus. You know, through Sonny, I went to the Olympia in Atlanta. I went to the Olympia in Long Beach. I went to the Olympia in Finland. I flew all the way there. You know, just just for one weekend, it was like a seventy-hour round trip because I love bodybuilding and, yeah. and I loved that I could be a part of something like that. You know, and and I met Big Steve back there in Finland, and they kind of adopted me. They're like, who's this crazy fuck? You know. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, you know, I met Jim Mannion back then. And, and, of course, all this sort of happened. And I'd always wanted to do a pro show out here. But the powers here, um, you know, they didn't want someone like me running the pro show because I knew if I did it, I was going to do it real good. So there was a lot of to and fro. And, and finally, I got permission to do that. So that was 2001. We did the first Australian pro. And this is a funny story because... You know, I traveled so much with Sonny and with some other Australian bodybuilders and gone overseas and been to the Ironman and been to, you know, all these Arnolds. I thought, you know, they, they treat people really well at the Arnold, you know, and okay at the Olympia, but not real great. But some of these smaller shows, they treat them like shit. Like I remember um, taking someone to the Ironman once and, you know, they weren't on a certain list, so they couldn't even get on the bus. So we had to follow the bus in a car. And the backstage, there was no warm-up equipment, no food, no drink. I'm like, I could do better than that. Surely. So I just had this idea that I'd do the first Australian pro and everyone said it's going to fail. Why is anyone going to come fucking all the way 20 hours to Australia? You know what Americans are like? They're like, oh, that's too far. That's not anywhere near America, right? So I really had a battle. And I remember, you know, and full credit, and he's still one of my best friends to this day, is Chris. You know, Chris Cormier had been out here guest posing uh, the year before and he goes, come on, I'll get all the boys to come. Just put the fucking show on. So he got you, he got Dexter, he got Melvin, he got Top of Mania, and that that became <laughs> that became our little crew, right? And uh, so I thought, I thought, you know, I don't have a lot of money. I didn't have any money, you know. I had I'd like borrow money to put a, a deposit down on the venue, but I thought I'm going to do this good. So I think I was the first promoter in the world to have fireworks. Remember that first year? Yes. I blew up stage with fireworks and, <laughs> yes. and, and set up tables for all, all you guys out in the foyer. I remember at halftime, we'd run out and I'd stand up on the table and say, here's Dennis James, come and buy some pictures. You're never going to get this chance again. And it was always it was always awesome over there. The fans were fucking crazy. The fans bought up everything. It was but I remember the first time I met you, sorry to interrupt, but I'm, I'm on, a, on a roll here, was I thought, you know, what are the, like as an athlete, I started thinking like an athlete, and I thought, what, what, what's going to stand out of the show to make me feel like I want to go back? And I thought, well, there's two things. The first one is have someone fucking pick you up at the airport because there's nothing worse when you're depleted, you've been dieting for like six months and you're, you're nearly dead, you're dropping water and your face is all fucked up and you land at some airport and you're going to get a hard time from customs as it is about food or medicines or whatever mm -hmm. else. And um, and then you've got to find your way to a hotel where they just have hotel food. So an easy fix. So I had drivers, you know, and I'd come pick you guys up and bring you straight to the gym. You, you remember this. I remember this the first time I connected with you we had a big barbecue set out on the footpath at the front of the gym yeah, or you yeah. got the sidewalk and and we were out there and we we cooked uh chicken breast we cooked steak we cooked fish and then inside i had yes. yeah, rice sweet potatoes potatoes everything i knew that a bodybuilder wanted to eat mm -hmm. then instead of putting you guys in a hotel room where there's just some shitty room service where you can get you know lasagna and pizza and there's no other food i went and got you guys like uh we called like self-contained apartments where they had a fridge yes. and, and a cooktop and, and a kitchen, right? And then I'd go there before you guys would land and I'd put a bunch of food inside of those rooms, you know, like, you know, a packet of rice and some some tins of tuna and some stuff that whatever you couldn't do. And then when you came to the gym, we had the takeaway container. So you could take as much chicken, mm -hmm. as much rice. So you guys walk out like, yeah, fuck yeah. And, and not to forget, you always have the legendary barbecue this Sunday after the show. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, 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 you know, everyone would go out and have some kind of after party or they'd you know, meet girls and end up in Melbourne's well-known nightclubs and this kind of thing. And, you know, everyone would get dragged their ass in the morning. And I remember it was pretty messy some of those times. But, Dennis, 
that was all I had. I, I couldn't offer the most prize money, but I could offer what I thought was the best experience yeah. in the world for pro bodybuilders to come to. And the word spread. I mean, you told everyone, yeah. and Dexter told yeah. everyone, and Chris yeah. told everyone. Yeah. And then over the years, man, we had some amazing lineups, you know, like 2001, 2003. And I remember back then, everyone said, oh, this won't last you. You won't do a second one or you won't do a third one. And up until the pandemic, that would have been our 21st um, consecutive show. So we became the third longest running show in the world only after the Olympia and Arnold in Columbus because Night of Champions died off and the Iron Man died off. So I just kept coming up the mm. thing and it ended up being the third longest running show in, in the world from, from nothing. How, how did you switch? How did that come about where you switched from doing the Australian Pro to the Arnold Sport Festival? How did that come about? Well, you know, I, I went to the Arnold with Sonny, as I said, like maybe 91 or something, 90. It was the first time I met Arnold. And I just, I was just like lined up in the VIP thing, got a picture. I was just, just another kid. I didn't speak to him or anything, but I'm like, wow, it's pretty cool. I remember I went inside the expo and everyone I was with was just like, fuck, look at this, oh, there's, you know, Lee Haney or Rich Gaspari or whatever. And they were just so overwhelmed by that. I was different. I, I was looking around at all the booths and it was kind of small back then, but you could see where it was going. There was mm -hmm. a few other sports. I'm like, I'm going to bring this to Australia one day. From the first time I walked in, I remember I met Jim Lorimer and I said, Jim, you know, if, if there was one question I could ask you, I said, when do you start working on next year's show? He just looked me straight down and he goes, Monday morning. I'm like, wow. That's a big commitment. I thought, I'm not ready. I'm not mature. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still you know, in party mode. I was a kid. I'm, I'm thinking, well, one day when I've got that mindset, I'd like to do this. So I just parked it. You know, and then when I started the Australian Pro, I kept thinking I'm going to add like a little expo to it. So I started this Fit X Expo. And the same year, you know, 2011 it was, um, Arnold finished being governor. And I heard his speeches and he's like, I'm going to take this Arnold's Classic, Arnold Sports Festival all over the world. I'm going to do one show in each continent. So I'm like, I'm going to be your Australian guy. No one else knew it, right? Everyone thought I was nuts, as always. But, you know, when I opened the first 24-hour gym, everyone said it'll fail. When I did the Australian Pro, everyone said it'll fail. So when I did this expo, yeah, it'll fail, sure. Watch. So um, I did that and I kind of modelled it um, on, on Arnold Columbus and I'd always – done the Australian Pro, you'd remember, always two weeks after Columbus. Mm -hmm. So you guys are already in shape. So I'm like, they're putting up the big money. I'll just do a little bonus on the end where someone can qualify, or the top three back then can qualify for the Olympia. And they're already in shape. They can come out here and have like a little holiday at the end of the season. So that was sort of the the, the mentality that in the spring season for you guys, it was just a, the final show. So then, of course, Arnold went and did the show in, in Madrid, in Spain. And I was just watching, watching. Then he said, uh, the next continent we're going to take over is South America. We're going to do a show in Brazil. So I was watching and someone sent me a, um, I guess it was a YouTube or something of his speech in Brazil. And he said, the next continent we're going to take over is Australia. I'm like, shit. Okay, so I'm, I'm reaching out to all the people. I'm thinking, who's he going to go to and ask about Australia? And, and probably the biggest influence of everyone was Jim Mannion. And Jim had given me a great chance when Jim took over the Pro League, which is a game changer for our industry, you know, you know, Wayne was really good to me early on to get me started. But when Jim took over, you know, he made me the, the pro director for Australia. Despite what the IFBB amateur was doing, anyone else, he didn't give a fuck. He goes, Tony's my guy in Australia. No one else is going to run a show down there. That's it. So when Arnold went to him, he goes, well, it's a no-brainer. He said, because the only guy that I was sanctioned a show to in Australia is Tony. Then um, my publicist at the time, Max Arnold, had done a tour with him for, you know, a real estate company or some other speaking thing. And I knew Arnold would go to him. So he's like, there's only one person you can work with in Australia, that's Tony and someone else and so on. So I, it didn't happen by accident. It was actually a plan that I thought, I'm going to build an expo that's just like Arnold's expo that's on two weeks later. So when he looks at Australia, he goes, well, this guy's already got the formula. He's already got the credibility with the pro, the pro bodybuilders and the pro league. And of course, the pro league was starting to shift away from the amateur league at the time. And um, that was so when, just, that, but that was when the IFBB would now IFBB elite and our IFBB was still connected. Oh yeah, yeah, and so, and so so I had to work with you know the Grahams and Raphael and all those guys in the first two Arnolds, mm. and they didn't like me at all because I'd got the Arnold and they hadn't, so they were always I felt working against me to, yeah. to make me look bad or for it to fuck up or whatever. 
But, you know, I knew I had Jim in my corner and credit to Jim, you know, he, he's been like my second dad and he still is, you know, even through the pandemic, you know, the one person in bodybuilding who called me just about every single week was Jim. Mm. Yeah, he never missed, you yeah. know, just to, just to see that I was okay. Yeah, and, and, and you know, he knows how loyal I am and I've done some stuff on the road to, you know, a lot of stuff's happened when we've been on the road. We've, we've had to fix things. We've had to be stand-up guys and, and, um, and do, the, you know, get things right. So Jim, I guess, saw a side of me traveling through some different countries over the years and he goes, he's going to be one of my guys, you know? And uh, so I think um, without him, I don't know that Arnold would have taken it seriously. And then, you know, oh, well, you know, anyone can look it up, but at the time I'd had a lot of bad publicity through the press with different things that happened at the gym and different friends I had and all this, and I had this big write up. And I know that the people that were running the Federation out here sent all the bad media to Arnold. Oh, do you want to, why would you want to go into a business with this guy? He's like a, a, a criminal, he's a thug and all his friends are bikers and all, you know, all this crazy shit. And I was just so lucky, you know, that Jim set him straight, my publicist set him straight and Arnold did his homework and checked out, you know, I didn't have a criminal record, I didn't have any any you know, bad blood with anyone, but it was easy for people to kind of play join the right, dots. Right, 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 because right. I run a hardcore gym. It's like, you know, Steve's gym in, 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 in New York, all, all kind of people go there. It's like Gold's gym in Venice, all kinds of people go there. Yeah. You know, that's that's what we attract. We're open for everyone and we treat everyone the same. So thank God Arnold um, could see through that and he could just see my passion and desire to do it. So, uh, you know, I flew out to the Arnold Classic. Well, I flew out and met Bob Lorimer originally and, and Bob, and credit to Bob, you know, he, he's the one who, who handpicked me took my name to Arnold and said, this is, I think it's the guy, let's do our homework on him. And then Bob flew out here to check out Melbourne. I remember I took him to the Australian Open Tennis, it was that time of year, and took him to all the restaurants. And he's like, man, there's no city in the world like this for sport because, man, you know Melbourne really well. Oh, you know, yes, like, yes. All the stadiums on the river in the city, you haven't got to drive like 10 miles to get to anything. It's, it's right in the middle of the city. And our convention centre is probably the best convention centre. And then that plenary theatre where we do the, where we do the Arnold now, not where we did the original Australian Pro, but the one you've come and worked at with us. I mean, that's the best bodybuilding theatre in the world, without doubt. You know, the Olympia's never had nothing like that. The Arnold's never had nothing like that. Um, it's a state-of-the-art theatre, the convention centre, the loading dock, the whole bit. It, 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 it's perfect. So when they saw that, they're like, all right, well, you got to come and meet Arnold. So I flew over to Columbus 2014, and I've got a new suit made and everything. It was funny because um, they had this this uh, lunch just for the world promoters to meet up with Arnold. So they had, you know, the team from Brazil, uh, who, who are great people and friends to this day. They had the people from Spain, which was Rafael and all his crew. And uh, I don't think they liked me from day one. <laughs> then, then they had this, um, this crew from China that were looking at it that never went through. They had the crew from um, South Africa who were just putting it together at the time. So and Jim Lorimer, I've never met Arnold. Jim Lorimer, you know, makes his speech and said that we're going to get each of the delegates, one delegate from each continent to get up and make a speech to Arnold and tell him why they should be the, the partner in that particular place. So I go into this room, I had a fucking new suit made, man, I'm nervous, tie on. I'm finally going to meet my idol. Right, you know? right. Not just meet him, but he's going to hear my name. We're going to shake hands. I'm, I'm happy. If, if this doesn't work out, I'm fucking good, you know. <laughs> and... Uh, so I go in there and each country had like a round table with 10 chairs with the, with the name you know, uh, South Africa, Africa, for, uh, sorry, um, Asia, um, Europe on the table. And I go in, there's a whole table set up, Australia. I'm fucking there on my own. <laughs> <laughs> so you came by yourself. So, yeah, so everybody else has have got their tables of 10. I'm sitting there on my own. <laughs> and Arnold walked in and he's like, what are you doing there on your own? Come and sit with me. So I got to sit at his table and then, you know, everyone got up and did these speeches about economics and this and this. And I didn't have much to offer, Dennis. So I just got up and I said, listen, if, if I get this opportunity, I promise you right now, I'll go home and I'll spend 365 days on this show. I'll give it everything I've fucking got. I'll, I, you know, I'll put on the best show Australia's ever seen. Just give me a shot because I can, I can outwork anyone, you know. And, you know, Arnold just, we just clicked from that day. I come down have a speech, he give me a hug and he's like, you're going to be one of us. And I went, you know, until the, the whole messy split up thing, I was, I think, the only promoter. I went to every single Arnold Classic um, in every continent. 
until I wasn't welcome in, in, in Spain, but I went to everyone. I went to Spain, I went to Brazil, I went to Africa and I became you know, part of the, the organizing team where I got to do Arnold's press conferences in Johannesburg and Brazil, got to MC quite a few of the shows around the world and sort of became one of the trusted people in that whole world. And, you know, went everywhere with Bob and, and, and his team. And it was the greatest adventure of my life, you know, and, uh, Arnold, um, I don't know, he just saw something in me early on and gave me so many opportunities, Dennis, um, because I delivered, you know, I said I was going to do I know something. what he saw. He, he saw the work ethic. He could, he's, you know, because can nobody say anything different than Tony Doherty puts everything into it, you know, and, and that's, that's what I witnessed from day one. You know, you take, Thanks, you take this stuff serious and you put, uh, you put all the time you have into, it doesn't matter if it's the gym or a show, whatever it was, it always looks well, like, You just want to make sure everything's done. Dude, if I'm mopping the floor, I'm all in, you mm. know. And, and I always say this to people when I'm doing, like I do a lot of you know, public speaking and mentoring and stuff. I always say, you know, you're either all in or you're not in at all. Make your fucking mind up. Don't don't just be yeah. like one foot in. It don't work out. But we had some good time on the road, man. I mean, not just the shows, but just, you know, where we might have met up in, might have been Tampa, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, You know, and, and I've made some great friendships out of bodybuilding through you and through Chris and, you know, and Jay and Mel and all all the guys, we became really close yeah. because we had this thing in common. We're always on the fucking road. We're always away from home. And, you know, it might be in Germany at FIBO or it might be the Olympia in Vegas. It might be the Tampa show or the New York show or the, the, the Pittsburgh show, you know, where everyone goes out to support yeah. Jim. Yeah. And you can see why, because Jim, you know, without Jim, this sport wouldn't be where it's at. And the fact that... Jim had the balls and the foresight to split from the amateurs and give everyone in the world a chance. Yeah. It's a great thing that happened. That's why you're promoting in Germany. Right. That's why I'm, I'm still in charge yeah. of Australia. And, it, it, you know, I can never say enough good stuff about Jim. But, you know, what a ride, man. It's been, you know, it it's been, really has been amazing. And I guess the last two years being stuck here, it's just made me more grateful. It hasn't yeah. made me bitter or twist or anything. It's just made me, yeah, of course I miss it, but it's made me just so grateful for what bodybuilding's given me, you know? Right, right. So are It's you been, plan, Are you planning on coming out to us, out of Australia or are you staying? Um, I can't come out to the Arnold because it's like two weeks away and we're just coming out of this shit now. It's just, mm. you know, and honestly, I can't afford to travel right now. I mean, I just got to work for a while, and get back on my feet again because we lost. So it was, that, it was, it was really that hard for, for everybody. Huh? We had no income. Uh, like imagine your gym doors shut for a year. You're yeah. still paying your rent. You're still paying your rates, your insurances. So, but did the government so, didn't, didn't g g give you guys no financial help? Yeah, a little, a little being the key word. So they uh -huh. gave you, you know, like a tenth of what you were losing. You know? uh -huh. So if it was costing you, you know, $10,000 a week to keep your gym open, they gave you two. Yeah. But you, you, didn't, so, but you didn't lose any members though, right? Yeah, we did. I mean, a lot of people moved away. A lot of people got the hell out of Melbourne, went up to Queensland because the laws, they didn't have lockdowns like we did. So a lot of people left the state. A lot of people moved out into the suburbs. Um, even now, a lot of the, um, what do you call it, public servants and stuff, they're all working from home. They just do this, all this Zoom stuff. Oh, right, they don't right. need to go to the office. So our city gym, um, particularly, you know, we've got all the gyms in Melbourne. So the city one right in the heart of the city, that really took a hit because our biggest our clientele were, were corporates and international students. So they cut the students off completely. They just started landing yesterday. So we've got two years with no students here at all and two years with no corporates in the city. Uh, when you say city, Jim, that's the one downstairs? Yeah, the one in, in the okay. vaults. You know, right, right. Whereas the big one in Brunswick where we do the barbecue, you know, we're still here. That's where I am now. This place is okay, you know, because it's like the mecca of Australia. So everyone came rushing back, you know, they couldn't wait to be here and um, you know, I did a lot of media um, through, it was good. I got an opportunity to be like the spokesperson for the fitness industry on all the mainstream media and the, you know, the national news and all the, the big shows. And, you know, I remained um, passionate, articulate, stuck to the facts, you know, always reminded people about the importance of mental health, mm. you know, and, and I felt that we got somewhere where towards the end, you know, we were opening up the same time as retail and hospitality. But early on in the first few lockdowns, Jim's, we get like an extra one month sentence at the end because the health officers were here. So, oh, they're dangerous places of transmission. And, and I just proved them wrong. I'm like, you show me your evidence, I'll show you mine. So I collected data from all over Australia, from all over the world, check-ins and everything else. 
and said, you want to play? <laughs> Put your helmet on because it's going to get real messy. And, um, you know, I feel that we got somewhere with that, which certainly helped our brand and everything else. Uh, but back to your question, um, I don't think I'll travel probably until the Olympia. Okay. Like that's that's where I want to be back. I want to go and do all the backstage interviews or some MC work or or something out there. Yeah. Um, you know, if if things come quick, really, really fast, I mean, I'd love to go to Pittsburgh and see Jim and, and thank him for for everything. You diet down, train hard, and supplement smart for months. When the time comes to step on stage, don't leave your tan to chance. Go with the pros. Pro Tan. Number one worldwide since 1987 and the official sponsor of the Olympia for the last 15 years. Don't step on stage without it. Pro Tan. But I think realistically, that's that's a 20%, whereas Olympia, I'm thinking I'm going to 100% be there. You know? yeah, be, that's that's where be... I'm going to be reunited with our family. Yeah, it's like, you yeah. know. It's time. It's about time because it's been, yeah, yeah. It's, been, it's been almost three years in December then. Yeah, yeah, correct. I mean, yeah, it's two years now and that's nearly a year away. So yeah, it'll be nearly three years. Thanks. And that's a lot to have you know, taken off you, Dennis. Like, you, no one could imagine this happening. You know, you think, yeah. oh, this is going to go for two or three months. I'll be back on the road. So, you know. We've all had to make some adjustments, everything else. But I just think, you know, there's, there's always someone worse off. I always have a saying that, you know, my worst day is better than someone's best day. There's some someone in, in, in some poor country True. that sees a plane in the air and they know they're never going to ride on a plane in their whole life. True. They know True. they're never going to open a gym or or do anything but work 12 hours a day to feed their, yeah. their family. Yeah. That's, that's you know, we've both travelled enough to, to have seen places. I say the same. I said, if I die tomorrow, I've been, I've done everything I ever wanted to do. Yeah. And How are you doing? And probably, you yeah, go on. And probably a little bit more. <laughs> I probably did a little bit more than I wanted to do. So, I mean, yeah. not that I'm looking forward to dying, but like what I'm saying, when I look at where I've been and what I've did, you know, and then I see guys, I see other people that have way more issues than we, and you know, and that's why I'm I'm trying not to complain. No, I'm I'm doing good. I'm 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 all right, you know. Yeah, you traveling again? Yeah, I've, yeah, I've been traveling. I'm I'm still going, you know, not as much as used to, you know, as frequent, but yeah, I've been to India, Dubai, Egypt, and uh, you know, going to I'm planning on going to Brazil now, and uh, oh, right sweet. after the Arnolds, and then uh, Germany. Lithuania, yeah, we're doing a few things, we're doing a few things. We're, we're back, you know. I mean, here in the U.S., especially here in Arizona, everything's normal. Everything's been normal for over a year, to be honest, you know. Yeah. There's no mandates, no mask mandates, you know. Some private, like, clinics or something, they request or require you to wear a mask when you go in. But other than that, you can do whatever you want to do, you yeah. know. That's why I was looking at Australia, and I was like, you know, we have the stadiums packed, stadiums packed with uh, no mask. And over there, the people are locked down, can't even leave the house. That that was crazy, man. That's why I was it thinking. It was crazy, you know. And, yeah. and, you know, I watch world news and obviously I follow all, all of our guys. I'm like, what the hell? How did this happen to Australia? This yeah. is a, you know, we're meant to be the freedom country, the don't give a fuck country. And all yeah. of a sudden we're, we're the oppressed people. <laughs> it's like, what? How did that happen? Yeah. You know? And, uh, you know, I hear that they say, oh, you know, Dubai and Egypt and all this sort of stuff. And, oh, man, sometimes it burns, bro, yeah. you know. How, really was, how, how is it for, for the, the competitors in Australia? You know, well, we're no just about to go into our – so the season that would have led into my expo in April, obviously I've killed off the expo because they couldn't guarantee us, um, you know, density limits. But the shows are going ahead. Mm. And um, I booked the pro qualifier in at the plenary where we do the pro show. So um, everyone's got a chance to come back and we've got pro cards on offer. Um, we're going to show in Adelaide, Perth, uh, Brisbane, Sydney, uh, Melbourne. So five shows each. So that guys have to do any one of those shows to qualify for the pro qualifier. So you got regional shows to qualify for the pro qualifier. Right. And then, and that all starts in March through to April. Then 23rd of April is our big day where everything's back and we're, you know, we've got the, the theatre booked. We're going to, the pro qualifier plus we're going to do um, pro bikini and pro men's physique because I've got enough pros here in those classes that right. if the borders are not open, we've still got enough people in Australia to, to compete and to do that. And it's a great opportunity 
for them because there's a good chance one of them will qualify for the Olympia. Well, so, some, somebody's going to qualify. <laughs> right, right, right. And, and if there's just Australians in it or a few from New Zealand or whatever, right. then it's a big opportunity. But someone might find a way in too. I mean, it's an open show. So we'll see how that goes. Um, So that's back and I'm really looking forward to it, man. Just right. putting the suit on, getting the microphone. And you, know, you, you sort of yeah. forget, who you, you you forget want... who you are. Yeah. You, you, know, you, you know, like from doing that, um, that became every weekend I'd be doing like here, I'd be at a show somewhere with a suit on, a microphone, yeah. making people laugh and entertaining. All of a sudden it doesn't it is no more. Right. So I'm really looking forward right. to just finding, you know, finding my happy place again. Right. And you not only promote your shows, you sometimes MC your own shows also. That's another yeah, thing. You have fun always, you have man. fun doing what you're doing, man. Yeah, man, I, I've always enjoyed emceeing shows. You know, like it was my dream to to MC in Columbus. You know, and and I got to do that the last two or three years. And you know, I remember, the, dude, the first time I walked up there, you know, and they introduced me as MC, and the place was packed. All Arnold's families down the front, and celebrities everywhere. I remember you were doing interviews backstage, and you know, I'm just like, how the fuck did I get here? <laughs> you know, <it's, laughs> It was like one of the happiest moments of my life. It it's really a, was. It's know? again, it's a work ethic, man. That's all it is, man. You know, it's, well, I think it's, it's, that, it's not the look. That, it's the work ethic, bro. Yeah, you, that look. <laughs> but I think it's that. And I think it, it, it's having passion for what you do. Yeah, yeah. You know, if I go out there, I want to be able to read the crowd and, and come up and down and feel when they're happy and make them happier and feel when I'm going to get a good laugh and just go, go really bad, you know, like mm. do a little comedy. But also, and I think this is probably why I've been – fairly successful at it is knowing what's best for the athletes. True. You know, every athlete hates it when shows drag on and people stand there and talk shit. Our oh, next competitor, he won Mr. New Jersey four times and then he went to freaking the world championship. And five minutes later, you know, he was third in the Ironman and fourth. So I got the script and I just tore the fucker up. I'm like, you know, I'm like, from Phoenix, Arizona, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only fucking Dennis James. <laughs> Yeah. And I could feel the people just thriving off this excitement, yeah. you know, that you can transfer to them. I could feel the athletes saying, fuck, this is where we're at. You know, let's pump the crowd up. And you remember the early days of Australia, man, I'd just go off. And you guys would come out and put on a show and it lifted us all up. Yeah. I remember the Australian, you know, the the Australian days, crowd. Was, the Australian crowd was always something else. Everybody couldn't wait yeah. to go to Australia. Yeah, you know, and then I remember you guys backstage. One of my greatest thrills was seeing you guys have so much fun. Yeah. You know, remember those times where fucking poor old Top, he'd be out there, maybe a little out of shape one year, yeah, doing what? and dancing. I remember you and Chris <laughs> and Dexter, you're wrapping the curtains around your head because you're giving him so much shit. You're in the sidelines. <laughs> do you remember, do you remember when that was a Sunday after? Saturday night must have been a long night for Chris. I know where you go. And he was he was sleeping on that on in the gym on that on that little on that bench. Yeah. And you remember when Chris went up there, and not Chris Dexter went up and scared him. You you were involved in it too. Yeah yeah you? yeah yeah. Of course. And he was on all he fucking was trying to run away on all four. Yeah, what it was, you guys. I remember we we got like a whole posse of people, and we moved in because he was halfway down in in the the gap from the front room to the leg room. Right. He's out, man. Yeah. The guy's out cold. And Dex is like, they've got a gun, they've got a gun. Yeah. They're going to shoot you, they're going to shoot you. Yeah, yeah. And he jumped up off the couch. He didn't know who we were. And he literally <laughs> crawled. <laughs> Uh, I gotta get, I gotta get Chris on here too. I gotta get Chris on here because I know he's got so many stories. But I want to talk to you about one athlete that comes to mind when I think about Australia, Josh Lenatovitz. What's going on with Josh, man? Is Josh done? Is he done competing, or is he coming back? Oh uh, man, you know he, he's on his way back. He had a really hard time. You know, he got this, I know. this brain tumor, and um, it, it, it affected him enormously because he had a couple of seizures. Well, first of all, when he, he went in to get this this lump taken out of his head. I remember and, that. I remember that, yes. And he was training for the Olympia. I still remember and the surgeon said, listen, you're going to go in Thursday. You'll be asleep for like an hour and a half. We'll wake you up Friday. You'll be out of the hospital in a couple of days. You can start doing cardio the next week. You know, man, he was in a coma for like 10 days straight. He woke up. He didn't know what day it was. We had to tell him, dude, the Olympia dream is over for this year. And he was like fucking 280 pound straight and the best he's ever looked. And... You know, then he tried to do a comeback after that. He didn't quite hit his peak because his brain just wasn't, it wasn't working properly to allow him 
You know what it was? He was getting these migraine headaches hmm. that were deliberating, deliberating. They would have wiped anyone else out. And he just sort of fought it and he hit it away and he did his cardio and did his weights and stuck to his diet. But everything kind of popped because, you know, he was he was suffering the whole time. Then he's had two or three more episodes where, you know, this head's giving him a hard time. Then he had to go and have the operation done again because he fell down in the gym and they realised that, when they, I guess, when they cut the hole in the skull, they put the cement or whatever they put in it, it didn't set properly because of him going into a coma. So they had to do the whole fucking thing again. Mm. But then he had headaches for another year. So I saw him just a few weeks ago and, uh, you know, and um, he's been working on his family and, you know, another kid coming, all this sort of stuff. Oh, he's got another one and, on his way now? Yeah, you know, I, hope, I hope that's been announced. But if it hasn't, well, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was a little bit ago, but so I'm sure that's that's public now. But yeah. um, you know, uh, he's got all that right, <clears throat> and it just it just man, this guy is a genetic freak. Like you know, I wanted to talk to you about Rami, but the same kind of thing. But this guy's just born for bodybuilding. Hmm. I mean, he's got a brother who's the same size as him, and he works in a nightclub and goes to gym a couple of days a week, and he's like 140 kilos. He's got bigger calves than Josh. I mean. It's, this family, man, that dad, he passed on some I, serious... I, I, think, I think I met his brother. I think I know where... where, where. Yeah, yeah, you would have met Adam. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Out somewhere, for sure. Yeah. And he's, he's just like a, a, a Josh, like an off-season Josh, you know? And he doesn't take it seriously at all, trust me. So, um, Josh, I saw him just a few weeks ago, and he'd been sort of back training, eating clean for like two weeks, and he looked like what anyone else would do in six months. I mean, seriously, he was back. He had that thin skin, those big veins hanging out. I'm like, you back doing stuff? He goes, oh, I've just started training in two weeks. You know, we've got the family thing sorted. And he's just trained at home. Like, this is the end of lockdown. And he was still, like, just training in his home gym. And he looked like the pro bodybuilder that he is. Right. So um, I think he's going give it, to give it a real nudge this year. I don't think he's picked out what shows he's going to do because we didn't know when the borders were going to open. But now everything's opening up. I think... Um, he's, he's got another run at it. And I, yeah. I, I still um, don't think we've seen the best of Josh. Well, he's got to remember, you know, he was a natural athlete in all those sort of federations until he was 30 years old. Right. You know, like Kai and like Ronnie, you know, those guys that built that kind of foundation. I mean, they've got a lot in the tank because they're so fresh. You know, all the yeah. Americans burn out because they're, they're doing it in high school. Is, but, is Josh a morning guy too? Can he get up early? Yeah, yeah, he gets up, does his morning walks. Um, you know, when when Josh trains, man, he, he's phenomenal. You know, I just, mean, I mean, can he get up as early as you? I know one get up as early as me, man. Because <laughs> I, no. I, well, I would like to bring him on too. So if he can get up at six, oh, he can do that for sure. Yeah, I'll talk to him. Talk, let's, let's talk, up. talk to him. I will send him a text too, because then I would bring him on next Tuesday. All right, I'll, I'll work on him right. I'm going to call him today. But um, look, Josh is, is a great guy, man. He's yeah. always got time for people in the gym, you know, and I don't think he realizes what a superstar he is. And, you know, if he goes outside of Australia, I was like, oh, my God, Josh, and there's um, pictures and cutouts of him. I remember we were in Brazil and there was all these cutouts of Josh. I caught him just standing, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> you know? yeah. But, um, you know, he, he, he's like me. He's from the country. So, you know, he grew up in a little country town and had a big dream. And man, he's a, he's a classy individual. Like, yeah. you, you know, Josh. Oh no, yeah, he, yeah. He picked, he's one of the good guys of bodybuilding, yeah. man. And I think everyone wants to see see the best for him. But he didn't do anything wrong. It's not like he abused stuff or he dumb dumb shit or whatever. Yeah. He just had this um, thing in his head, and it, it turned out his little brother had had the same thing uh, when he was 18 years old. It was mm. just this this kind of tumor. Thank God it didn't get like right into his brain. It would have wiped him out. But. <clears throat> For him to train through those headaches he was having, man, he'd, he'd have to stay in a dark room for like 12 hours at a time just to be able to come out and do a three-hour workout. Uh, trust me, That's I know about migraine. I have migraine since I was a baby. Right. Yeah. So when I saw him a few weeks ago, um, he was through the worst of that. He said it was the best he'd felt like literally in years, and he's as big as a house, man. Dude, cool. Yeah. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I know you're the interviewer, but I'm going to turn on you. You know, last year... Uh, the last two years, seen you guys working with Rami, you and Chad, and I remember I reached out to you at the time. <laughs> Man, I, I think it brought so much joy to the sport, you know, because we've seen this guy, everyone. I remember interviewing, um, because remember I did all the backstage interviews for NPC for years. I remember when we had that whole Kai-Phil 
thing going on through 11, 12, 13, 14. You know, and I'd always say to them, you know, either on air or off, off air, what about Rami? And they'd go pale. They'd be going, man, if he gets his shit together, we're all fucked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, 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 like everyone knew it. It's like if he could just stop trying to be, you know, 200 kilograms peeled on stage. I remember saying to Rami, I didn't interview him, I'd go, Rami, have you thought about maybe coming in 20, 30 pound lighter? Because they go, no, it'd be too small. I go, Rami, if you're 30 pound lighter, you're still the biggest guy in the show and you'd be untouchable. And somehow you and Chad got through to him because not lastly, be the one before when he came in shape. You know, you see some Olympias, Dennis, or some others where the winner just walks out and you know, yeah. you know, uh, you can just go back. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. now, now we've got to work out who's second and third. I thought he was first, second, and third. <laughs> Dude, you know, I've been around bodybuilding as long as you have, and you get to know shit, you know. Yeah. And um, I remember the only other time I saw it, we were in Brazil when he won the Arnold in Brazil. Yes. And he just kind of peaked. You know, I remember the pre-judging was a little watery, little flat. And he came out for the finals. Like, dude, yeah. he's a mutation. What the hell is that? Yeah, you I know? think I think Chad, Chad Chad is a good fit for him as a, as a as a coach and 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 he learned how to suffer. You know, not only for a day or two, for weeks and months. You know, when it comes to yeah. dieting. I remember early on when you were working with him, you're like, man, the guy just doesn't want to do the work. And I remember when Chris was trying to help him with his pose, and he goes, man, you get 20 minutes in and just leave the room. He just yeah. gets out. No, oh, no. God. I thought we've, I didn't want to say I forced him, but I said, this is the way it's got to be. We got to pose several times a day, and there's no, you know, I'm tired. You know, you can't say I'm tired when you're on stage. And he got it. Thank God in 2020, he won the Olympics, so he understood that he didn't do this for nothing. You know, you know, it was just a matter of time and a matter of, you know, finding a way to make him understand that this is what you got to do to win the Olympia. You yeah. Know? You know, because and, uh, you all know. the others will do the same thing. And now, you know, others understand, oh, there's a little more to it. You know, we got to maybe do a little bit of extra. I've always been fascinated with, you know, the psychology of the mindset of a champion. Hmm. You know, and it's one, it's, it's not everyone's got it. Like you can be, you can be good at this sport, but to be great at this sport, let's go back to Uncle Ron. You know, Ronnie had something mentally that no one else ever had. You know, he didn't he didn't give a fuck, man. No. You know, uh, remember like <clears throat> when he was when those when he was at his like those two thousand three, four, five years, he was just so untouchable because he was willing to go to places no one else was willing to go. Yeah, right. And I don't mean chemically, I mean the shit he did in the gym and the shit he did on his diet. And he won the Olympia what three times when he's working in a squad car 10 hours a day. Yeah. And I get kids saying to me, oh, I'm going to give up my job to do my first show. I'm going, whoa, <laughs> have you heard about Ronnie Coleman? <laughs> he was more worried about his health benefits and superannuation than winning the Olympia. So he hung on to his job. Yeah. But, you know, he'd have to get up at like three in the morning to get on that skanky treadmill in his house and then to get his 10 meals in. And he'd go back to the gym at night. I remember even we are on the road all those years. Ronnie wanted to go to the gym at midnight, shit like that. The guy, he just had this different mindset. It was because of where he'd come from. He'd been poor, yeah. you know, for him to be put into that position. Remember, <clears throat> I think it was Chad said it once. That, you know, they were talking to Ronnie and they, no, it was when Chad was training Ronnie for the Olympia and he said, you know, we're nearly there, Ronnie. He said, now you've got to tell me straight. Did you cheat on your diet? Is mm -hmm. anything, yeah. you, you know this story, anything you need to tell me now is the time. And it, Ronnie looked at him like he was from another planet. He goes, who 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 would do that? <laughs> but he didn't he didn't know that that was a thing. Yeah. Look at me, who cheat on their own diet? You're just cheating on yourself. You go, that's the most stupid thing I've ever heard. Yeah. And you know, of course, Chad's used to working with guys a little flaky, and here's this guy who just looks him straight now. I go, hell no. Yeah. Yeah. Not not in this lifetime. Yeah. There's not a lot. There's not a lot like Ronnie, and 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 there will never be another Ronnie. I don't I don't think so. You know? I'm with you. And uh, and uh, but you know the sport is safe. We still have good guys coming up and uh hopefully we can see josh back on stage you know i would really like to talk to him so if you can get through him i will send him a text ask him if yeah, he can do it next okay. week and then hopefully we'll see you back here man at the shows like the good old days man because i know you're yeah, over there yeah, you're over there ready to go you're ready to go i'm ready to go man I'm, I'm always ready to go so this is where it's been hard because you know i've always been really spontaneous where jim and say i need you to go to India or you know, can you go here or one of you guys will call up and say we need an MC. I'm like, I'm going to the airport now, you know. Right, right. So I've had to switch that off 
and then to re reprogram it's, it's been a little tricky yeah but um you're right too i think that there's some really good guys coming up in the sport it's in a great place i mean you know what about dexter man i mean shit. like when yeah. he did that last show well in columbus and then his last olympia i mean fuck, he's as old as us and he's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, he's still pushing for the top spots. I mean, still. wow, he was he was on and top? He was basically on top for for for, for nineteen years in the top. Yeah, three. Yeah. I always said it was it was three generations of bodybuilding. Yeah, twenty, twenty. He did how many Olympias did he do? Twenty. Well, or this way, he was he was he was here at that first Australian Pro in twenty twenty one. Yeah. That's two thousand one, and he's still competing in twenty twenty one. So that's twenty years. He did the first Olympia in ninety nine. There you go. There's like 20 Olympias. Yeah, but he said he set out one, but he did the one in 2020, so he did 20 Olympias. Yeah. Dude, wow. Just think about just think about that. There won't be another Dexter either. There won't be yeah, another you know, Dexter. I don't. We're think gonna so. make sure you know when we talk about the, the the greatest of all time, we talk about you know those guys who really made their mark, who won so many shows, yeah. you know, and they can easily get forgotten. And I think that's. It's important, you know, for the historians of the sport and the fans of the sport to make sure we remember, you know, Kevin, yeah. won a shit ton of shows, obviously Ronnie, but Vince Taylor, you know, people forget Vince won over 20 pro shows at one stage there. He was the most winning pro true, ever. True. I mean, he was untouchable, man. When he did those European Grand Prix and shit. Wow. Yeah. You know, and then the next one that you can put in that category was Dexter. That's another, I'm glad you mentioned Vince because that's another one I want to bring on. So I'm just making notes here. Thank you. <laughs> Tony, yeah, but, uh, I'm gonna let you go, my man, because I'm running out of time here and I don't wanna I don't wanna piss off my production team. <laughs> right, well it's first thing in the morning here, so I got I know, to do. I know. Listen, and, I appreciate you coming on, man. I appreciate you getting up early. And I'm looking forward to uh the Australian bodybuilding and the competitions and the bodybuilding back to full full booming and you know and i know you got this under control man i appreciate what you do for the sport not only in australia but worldwide you know you one of the good ones and i can't wait to see you again brother love it man thank you for having take me on and to everyone out there see you on the road huh all right for sure man take care god bless you brother stay Good safe up.